Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Rich, for the introduction. And also, uh, thank you to Google for letting me come to talk about my research. I really appreciate that. It's a lot of fun. And I'd also like to just quickly thank Dalhousie University and Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, my institution, um, for the great support they give me at studying the impact that the internet and the World Wide Web actually has on things like our culture and our society, in particular uh, on religion. So thank you also to Dalhousie University. Now, uh, the talk uh, today is called Turning Cyberspace into Sacred Space. And uh, my my focus of research is really looking at how people are using the religion, are using the internet to do religion on the internet. It's a very particular um, type of study, but I'll start out um, just talking about it generally. Uh, this is an, an article that was in the local paper uh, a little while ago by John Tatry. I thought it was very fitting since I'm at Google that I would bring up this article he did on my research. He called it Googling for God. And uh, basically he wanted to know about the impact that the internet and the World Wide Web actually has on religion and people's religious beliefs and religious practices. And it's a very broad phenomena. At its most basic level, um, we know that when people want information nowadays, when they want to get information about something, whether it's about, uh, you know, they're writing a paper for university or they're taking a trip to South America, um, they turn to the internet to try and find their answers. And what's interesting we've seen now is that when people have religious questions, they're also turning to the internet to look for their answers. And that's having a huge impact on things like religious authority and um, information seeking behavior when it comes to religious practices. Historically, they would have to talk to a priest or they would have to go to a temple or they would have to somehow talk to a specialist. And they don't anymore. Now they can go into the internet. Um, and that's really changing uh, a lot of the religious environment in our contemporary society. But what I'm particularly interested in is how people do religion on the internet, in particular how they're using that technology to facilitate um, religious practices. Now just to put it in context, um, religion on the internet is an enormous phenomena. If we look at the DMOZ or Google's Open Directory project, um, looking at the number of websites dedicated to religion and spirituality, you can see there's about 110,000. It's usually between about 107, 110. And religion and spirituality is a subsection of the society group. So it's just a subsection of the society group. But in the entire science group combined, so all the websites on the World Wide Web dealing with science, um, there's only about 102 or 104,000. So we have more websites dealing with religion and spirituality than with science, which shows you how prolific um, religion is on the internet. Um, at Time Warner did a study in 1996, and they're sort of looking at the internet or the World Wide Web as an interesting phenomena, and they started to look at the types of sites that were showing up, and they found there were three times as many websites concerning religion and spirituality than there were concerning sex. So right off the bat, um, you can see there's a lot of, of sites dealing with religion. Now the interesting thing though is that this doesn't actually tell us what these sites are for or how they're being used. So I'll, I'm going to focus the talk in and looking at how people actually use this uh, medium to do religion. And the best way to do that is really to start um, from the beginning. Right, you guys recognize this? The supercomputer um, you know, of the 70s and the 80s there. Um, when we talk about religion on the internet, to understand really uh, how it appeared there and how it started to, to function, you have to go to the start. And, and that really happened with the development of the modem program. Right? When, people, when the modem was developed and people could have public access to the internet system, religion appeared online. And that was very interesting because most academics and most people studying religion thought that religion was disappearing and religion was slowly uh, leaving sort of the public sphere. And as people became more technological or more scientific or more modern, they would be less religious. But we see in the very first use of modem, the very first bulletin board systems, we see people talking about religion. So this shows us that these computer hobbyists, these people that were very advanced, uh, very scientific, advanced technologically for their time, were still talking about religion and using uh, the internet to talk about religion. And it actually got to the point that um, in 1983, in the, in the early Usenet system, people started to complain about the amount of religion that was occurring on the internet. I remember uh, reading some of these posts um, and there was one complaint, someone said, you know, I have to sift through God knows how many but doesn't care articles on religion every single day. So 1983, very early in the Usenet system, hundreds of posts are, are dealing with religion at this time. And there was a real debate in Usenet um, trying to determine if religion should have its own group. Because right, people were paying for this service. Um, some people didn't want to read about religion or didn't want to, uh, you know, engage in that type of dialogue. But there was a big debate over whether religion should have its own group. And it was started in February of 1983. They, they decided to have a separate group for religion. And people started to use this environment um, to talk about religion and to share their religious beliefs um, and to engage in religious-based dialogue. Now, although it was a, an area for talking about religion, it wasn't really a religious environment. 
Uh, if anything, if you express your beliefs, if you express your personal feelings about religion, you're really exposing yourself um, to a lot of ridicule and to a lot of criticism. And often you'd have to defend yourself against an onslaught of people challenging what you believed. And um, it could be a very difficult thing to do when you're talking about faith-based dialogue to have to defend yourself um, against an onslaught of criticism. So even though they're talking about religion, it's not really a religious-based environment. And we see that um, within about a week uh, after the religion Usenet had developed, um, enormous numbers of flame wars started to happen in this environment. A lot of tension. Um, this is one of the early ones. I think it's a very interesting one. And that some of the uh, early Christian members of the Usenet group started to complain to the Jewish people, saying, you know, uh, we accept the, the Old Testament as being accurate, you know, sacred scripture, so why don't you accept the New Testament? You know, it's only fair. Um, you know, we accepted your testaments, your sacred scriptures, you should accept ours. Um, and it really escalated, and it, it got very controversial, and I like the way it ended um, uh, with someone from the Jewish community who's participating on the system. He said, while we are civilly considering why Jews do not accept the so-called New Testament, why don't we also consider why Christians don't accept the later revelation? The Book of Mormon, for example. Surely everyone is always interested in the latest update on the Holy Word, or don't you all have a loose-leaf Bible? Right, so enormous amount of tension uh, occurring in these environments. And it actually got to the point that I think a lot of people were afraid to share their beliefs, afraid to share their, their religious concerns in these environments where they had to defend them. And it was actually the Jewish members of Usenet that said that if they wanted an area where they could really talk about their faith and they could share their faith and they could express their religious beliefs openly, um, they needed a separate system. They needed their own Usenet group just for talking about Judaism. And they put forth the argument uh, in, in early 1984 that they should have a separate section called net.religion.jewish. Um, and there was a lot of controversy because Usenet is expanding. Um, people are paying for this service. They don't know should there be all these separate groups or not. Um, but they made a very good argument. They said that basically um, there has to be a safe area where we can talk where criticism of Jews for being Jews would not be welcome. So let's create a safe area where we can talk about our faith and talk about our practice. And in many ways, by arguing for their own online community, they were arguing for their own online identity, you know, where they could have a safe environment to express themselves from all over the globe. Certainly, people in diaspora could come together now uh, in this new network. And they did get permission um, to start net.religion.jewish in February of 1984. And very quickly, this became a very um, engaging environment where people could share their faith and they could express their feelings and they could talk uh, without any fear of being criticized or any flame wars breaking out. Now, although there was some tension over, you know, between the conservative and the orthodox and reform members of the Jewish tradition on the Usenet, um, for the most part, it was a very dynamic environment um, where people were really free to share. And it got to the point that a lot of other traditions saw how, how beautiful this place was for talking about religion, and they tried to copy it. Um, the Buddhist members of the Usenet group and the pagans and the, some of the Wicca groups also petitioned um, for their separate Usenet network. Um, but because the system's getting so big, they were all declined. Um, but about a year and a half later, the Christian group um, got its own network. So there actually ended up being three religion Usenet groups. Net.religion, which is just sort of general discussion about religion. Um, Net.jewish and then net.religion.christian. Or, uh, yeah, .christian um, were for people in the Christian community. And again, as soon as they had a separate group uh, for the Christian uh, people on the Usenet network, people really started to share faith. They really started to express themselves. They would request prayer. And interestingly enough, again, this is 1985, so it's very early, um, when people would sign off on their posts, even though they were from Bell Labs or some of these great universities where their cutting-edge technology is being used in the internet medium, um, they would still express a lot of faith. They'd sign off, you know, in Christ, or God bless you, and may the Spirit be with you. And there was no fear um, of any repercussions for expressing their faith in this environment. Now, as far as doing religion on the internet goes at this time, um, a lot of people going into this network were doing things like asking for prayers, prayer support, prayer requests, talking about their faith. Um, but it was limited. It is a text-based um, interaction. It is a bulletin board. And, and some people, maybe for doing religion, that's not necessarily a good way of expressing their religious beliefs. So they were limited uh, when they tried to do religion on the internet. But with, with the religious sort of desire to use this technology, um, for religious purposes, uh, the environment did change fairly quickly, and people sort of show, um, <clears throat> excuse me, socially shaped the technology um, so that it could meet their religious needs, which is a very fascinating thing. Instead of letting the medium limit them in the way that they could communicate, in the way that they could do religion, they actually 
altered the medium a little bit so that they could use it for religion, and then they altered their beliefs a little bit so that they could somehow incorporate that technology. And we see things like this early online ritual, um, which was actually facilitated by an Orthodox, uh, an Orthodox priest, a, a minister, um, for IRC. So people could log in at the same time synchronistically from all over North America, in this case also from Australia and New Zealand, and they could actually participate in an online ritual. Like they could use this technology to do a ritual, and, and there was a facilitator, there was a priest in charge, um, and people would log in. You could lurk, um, but he encouraged people to actually take part in the ritual itself, where they would meet, um, different people would do different parts of the service, and then they would share, and there would be prayers, and there would be uh, quiet time, and then um, sharing. And it was actually quite an interesting structured um, ritual. So people could get together online and actually do religion. Now again, the, the technology itself may not have been created for that. If you think about it, um, you know, the internet wasn't, when people envisioned it, I don't think they thought that, that this was for doing religion, but people wanted to do religion on this medium. So they certainly developed it uh, for that purpose. And with the great renaming um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when the Usenet system sort of opened up uh, for more groups and the alternative alt network was developed so that there could be a lot more groups, um, religion just exploded. It completely exploded into this medium where we get hundreds of groups um, tens of thousands of postings each year. And this is the 1990s, you know, where Gopher, um, you know, you're trying to find out if the library has a book and it's going to take you a half hour on your dial-up modem to find out. You could have caught the bus down and checked yourself, but it was fun to use, you know, the internet. So these are computer hobbyists. It's sort of awkward technology still at this time. And yet tens of thousands of postings each year uh, dealing with religion. And, um, and so fascinating uh, expansion. And with the development of the World Wide Web, then it's no surprise that all this sort of religious activity quickly seeped into the World Wide Web and, and exploded. And religious representation on the World Wide Web um, really took off very quickly. And again, as I said earlier, Time Warner found in 1996 three times as many sites concerning religion and spirituality than there were concerning sex. So prolifically uh, expands into the World Wide Web. And in the World Wide Web, in the early web, we actually find that some of the best websites made were made by religious organizations. So something like the Scientology website or the Church of um, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Vatican, they created these enormous great websites um, very early on on the World Wide Web to talk about religion or at least to share their religious beliefs. The Vatican site is a good example of, of a very advanced website for its time. Um, it was actually hosted on three supercomputers that they named Raphael, Gabriel, and Michael. So it's an enormous, complex environment, beautifully done, available in six languages. And just an absolutely incredible website that gives you any sort of information you would want to know about Catholicism, their teaching, their beliefs, their dogmas, anything you want. But they did a mistake in some ways, or at least someone like Zelensky, an early researcher of, uh, of the internet environment, said that they, they did something interesting and in that there are no bulletin boards on this website. There are no chat rooms on this website. You can't email someone. You can't request the Pope to pray for you. You can't use this technology in any sort of interactive way. So if people wanted to do religion, in that environment, they're really limited. All they can do is get information. And when most people want to do religion, um, they want more than just information. They don't just want to be receiving information about a belief system. They actually want to be engaging the, system, you know, the belief and, and somehow participating in it. So this is certainly limited uh, in that it's one-to-many communication. A good way to think of it would be like a hierarchy, you know, top-down communication to the world below um, instead of interactive many-to-many -many communication, which was what the Internet was really designed for. So although it's limited, again, if people want to use this technology to do religion, they're going to shape it so that it can meet their religious needs. And a good example of that at this time uh, is someone like Mark Pessy. And some of you may be familiar with him. He was the co-creator of the virtual reality modeling language. Um, so he had a huge impact on the World Wide Web as we know it today. I mean, he's also a techno-pagan. He's a neo-pagan that believes that religion can happen over the internet and that cyberspace is sacred space. And he did develop uh, a number of online rituals um, to be conducted actually on the World Wide Web. And these are two of them uh, that he did um, for religious purposes. In 1994, um, he did a celebration of Cyber Cement. And then when his friend died, he did a, what he called the Long Night, a Yule ritual, that he used the internet um, so that he could do this religious activity. And the way he did that is he actually set up computers in different directions of his room in different areas, and people logged in from all over the world, um, participated in the ritual, and everyone had parts, and they did a very complex ceremony. Um, but for them, it was a very authentic 
um, form of religious practice. And you can see that they actually socially shaped the technology so that it could meet their religious needs. But then they also had to adapt their religion a bit so that it could be used in this environment. But a good uh, merging sort of can happen um, in these online rituals. And we see that uh, very early on in a lot of the Wiccan and neo-pagan and techno-pagan groups that they actually believe that you can do ritual on the internet. And we start to see a lot of websites um, opening up and allowing for that. So unlike the Vatican and a number of organized religious traditions, um, some groups start to allow for people to interact and allow for people to um, develop online ritual areas. This is a good example. This is the dance, a uh, Wiccan pago, uh, pagan sort of neo-pagan website. And again, though, they had to develop their religion to be able to accommodate this new environment because what are the rules for doing online ritual? You know, how do you, how do you do ritual on the internet, right? It's very complex, and they actually had to figure out how to do that, so they developed things like circle etiquette, you know, telling people if you log in at the time during the ritual how to, how to act in the environment, things like that. But it be, started to become popular, and a lot of different sites started to host online rituals. This is another example. Uh, this is the dance, and these are some of the rituals that they did. So certainly there were people um, engaging in online ritual activity at this time. Uh, here's another one, online Wicca, Wiccan rituals. And people would log in. Most of these were held in sort of IRC chat uh, areas where um, it was synchronistic and that you had to be there at the right time at the right place, and then everyone would have their part and, and um, could participate in the ritual. And although this is going on at the time, and it certainly is a good example of people using this internet technology and the World Wide Web to actually do religion, it was rare um, for people to do this type of practice. So number-wise, not a lot of people doing online rituals in the, in the 1990s, early 2000, um, but, it, but it was still happening. Um, where we see probably the most uh, religious activity occurring on the World Wide Web in the early uh, years of the World Wide Web was actually in online virtual pilgrimages. That was one area that developed uh, quite significantly quite early on where the different people or different groups actually wired um, sacred sites so that you could log in and you could have a virtual sort of pilgrimage at a sacred site. This is 1998. It's part of a Durga Puja in Calcutta and the government helped sponsor it so that they could wire the festival so that people wherever they were in North America or, or Great Britain, uh, pretty well anywhere in the world, they could log in and they could see this online um, uh, the pilgrimage as it was happening uh, through the internet. And it was very popular. Um, some of the papers and, and uh, magazines writing it about, about it at the time said, you know, it's not the real thing, but if you're in North America or if you're in diaspora, um, it's the next best thing. Right? If you live in North America and you had come overseas, um, there's no way that you're going to be able to participate in Durga Puja. You're not going to be able to watch it on TV. You, you know, there's no way to connect with it. So they actually started to do these online virtual pilgrimages for people in diaspora, and they could log in. They could see what was going on. They could get um, sound. They could hear about the festivals. They could leave messages on bulletin boards and, and uh, watch all this sort of activity. So for a lot of people, um, it's not the real thing, but it was the next best thing for them, and certainly a way for them to connect to the space. In many ways, uh, the Internet was shrinking the space so that they could be there. They could at least see the rituals that were going on. And that was 1998. Um, it became so popular, virtual pilgrimage became so popular that a number of sacred sites have been wired. This is a good example. This is the Kumbh Mela uh, 2001. It's the largest pilgrimage that ever happens on this planet. It, it goes on, I think, every 10 or 12 years. Um, and again, it was wired. It was live wired so that people could log in anywhere in the world and see this uh, pilgrimage happening. Um, without necessarily having to be there, but very successful um, for bringing people to, from anywhere on the planet to these sacred sites. And it became very popular. Cyber pilgrimage has become a very popular sort of thing. Um, this is the Golden Temple, where they put in special cameras, so you have a, a feed coming in, you can get sound, you can get the messages, you can, in many ways, you can sort of participate with the, with the environment. Um, here's some of the feed. All right, so you can travel around in the temple, um, see the sacred place, um, and do that through your computer at home. No matter where you are in the world, you can log in uh, and do sort of a cyber, cyber pilgrimage. Um, so that's very popular. Um, cyber Hajj or virtual Hajj is also becoming popular. The Hajj within the Muslim uh, tradition, Hajj is something you should do once uh, if you're Muslim, and that is you would travel to Mecca and Medina and you would go on a, a pilgrimage. Um, Virtual Hajj has become very popular for people because even if they've done it once, it's nice to be able to redo it every year um, and sort of relive the experience. And they, there are a lot of websites now devoted to presenting uh, live Hajj or virtual Hajj. 
And again, they say, even on the website, they say, you know, it's not the real thing, but take the virtual hatch. It's the closest thing to being there, right? It's the next best thing. So they're, they're shrinking space and they're allowing people to be in this uh, environment or to at least see the environment through their computer. Uh, here's another one. Uh, and this one, they say, if you're not able to go to Hajj, then experience the next best thing, the virtual Hajj. Right? So for people, it's not the same, but it's the next best thing. And certainly becoming very popular. Virtual pilgrimage is becoming very popular. Here's another, uh, the virtual one. And as far as virtual pilgrimage goes, you can also go to sacred sites that you may never be allowed to see in the real world. Some of these sites uh, might be off limits because of restoration reasons, or they don't want tourists in because it's such a sacred site. Um, this is a good example. This is a chapel. Uh, you can't just go there and, and walk around and see it, but through virtual reality, um, you can now go into that environment. You can see that environment and participate in the environment. And there are also people doing virtual pilgrimages in places that have uh, existed historically or may never have existed at all. So you see a lot of three-dimensional virtual reality images of things like Stonehenge or um, you know, sacred sites, the Second Temple. Uh, Jerusalem has been rebuilt and you can actually go there in many ways on a pilgrimage and travel through the Holy of Holies and see this uh, place in virtual reality. Now the issue with virtual um, pilgrimage is that there is a disconnect that occurs though between the person who's watching it on their computer screen and the actual pilgrimage itself. I mean to be a pilgrim means to be uh, far afoot and usually when you're a pilgrim there's some sort of sacrifice that's required so that you have sort of a spiritual give and take. There's a reason you go on the pilgrimage and when you go on the pilgrimage you get some sort of benefit. Um, now when you're watching that on your computer it's, it's, it's certainly limited. But again with the social shaping of technology you can never really underestimate um, how people's desire to do religion on the internet will sort of push that technology along so that it can actually meet their spiritual needs. Um, this is just an example. This is the virtual uh, pilgrimage of uh, Krog Patrick, which is a uh, mountain in Ireland. And Reek Sunday's coming up. It's in July, and about 25,000 people will go there to do the pilgrimage. Um, but to do the pilgrimage properly, you, you have to do it in bare feet. Right? So you'd walk up the mountain in bare feet, and you would leave your blood behind, and when you finished the pilgrimage, you would go away with a clean slate. You would be forgiven of your sins, or you would lessen your time in purgatory, however you want to see it. So there's a real spiritual give and take that occurs in pilgrimages, but how do you do that in a virtual way? You know, how does it happen? How do you have that connection with the real place uh, in a virtual way? And it is an interesting issue, but it is also something that, that a lot of people have tried to overcome um, by adapting the technology. One example is Lourdes. Right, Lords um, is wired with webcams. There are a number of webcams at Lords uh, live feed 24/7, so you can go and see this very sacred place. You can have sort of a traditional online pilgrimage, which is very nice, but then you can actually do something more. Right, you can actually interact with the environment instead of being just a disembodied avatar where you're floating around space and no one's there. At Lords, you can request a prayer, um, and it's not just that you request a prayer. You fill out this form. Um, but when you submit it, you actually get a response saying that they've received the prayer petition. It has been received. And the nice thing about this, though, is that it will be printed. Um, they will be taken. They will be given to the priest in the chapel. And during a special service, he is going to read them. And you can watch that live from your computer. So you're not just a disembodied avatar anymore. You're actually interacting with the environment. You're actually manipulating the environment. And you're having a real effect. You're having a real effect on this place where you've submitted a prayer. They've received it. Um, and you can actually then hear it um, being, being set, uh, given at, uh, during the service. So you've really interacted with the environment. And we, here's the, uh, the, the sacred grotto. Another good example of interacting with the environment is the, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Right? You can set that as your screensaver, and it's nice to be able to watch you know, live feed of the Wailing Wall, particularly if within your tradition that is a very sacred place for you. But to be able to do something more um, is important for a lot of people. And what's happening at the Wailing Wall, um, there it is there, is that you can place a note. You can have a prayer placed in the wall for you. So as an avatar, you log in, you can see that, you can see the site, and then you can enter a prayer request, and you will type it up, and they will receive it, and they wait usually about once a week, and then they print them up very small font to roll it up on paper, and they will take it, and they will put it in the wall for you. So again, as you're an avatar, but you're not disembodied, you're actually interacting with the environment, um, and leaving even proof, tangible proof, that you have been there. Your presence has been there. You've had an impact on the site. And for many people, leaving a, a prayer in the Western Wall is a, an incredibly powerful religious experience. I mean, that's one way of coming close to God. The, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, was in that area. And it's one way, by leaving the prayer there, that you're actually leaving your prayers very close to, um, to God. 
So a very powerful thing, but facilitated through the internet. Now, where we see probably the most, uh, the, the strongest connection of, of this type is in, within Hinduism. Um, very early on, in 1999, uh, this site, Suriname.com, made it their mandate to be able to offer people in diaspora, Hindus in diaspora, the ability to connect with any temple uh, in India and have ritual conducted for them, specifically for them. So they set up the website so that people could log in and they could request a prayer or ask for a prayer to be done in a certain temple for them. Um, they even offer something like a puja wizard. So if you're not sure what would be the best uh, you know, ritual to be done for you, you can, you can go in and it will calculate it. So if you have a job coming up or something like that and you're going for a job interview, um, you could put in career and it will calculate all these things and it will say, well, if it's a job interview, the best place you could do that, temp you know, that sacrifice uh, would be in northern India at this particular temple at this time of year to this god. And that's the absolute best ritual you could ever do. Now, if you wanted to do that in real life, you'd have to travel there. You'd have to go on this enormous expense, this great pilgrimage to northern India. But through their company, you can just log in. Uh, they'll contact the priest. Everything will be done for you. And they will guarantee that this service was going to be done in your name at that place and at that time. Right, so you log in. Um, in some ways, it's more than a virtual pilgrimage because you're actually requesting the ritual. And it's shrinking the space. It's as if you're there um, to have this done for you. And when it's finished, uh, in many cases, they will have a video of it. Um, then they will send the offerings back to you. You can pay extra if you want it sent in UPS. You can get it within three days back from these temples in India. Um, but you've had a real interaction with the environment, even though it's just a virtual connection. Um, so you will get back. These offerings will come in the mail, uh, the video CD. Um, and you've really connected with the environment. You've had a real connection to that place. Here are some of the most popular temples. Again, some of the most sacred places in India have been wired so that you can do this service. And historically, there were issues of um, gender. Uh, you know, some temples were restricted to, to, to men. Uh, in other cases, there's caste issues where people of certain caste may not be allowed to go into a certain temple. But again, through the internet now, um, those restrictions in many ways are being bypassed and people can log in and they can request these very sacred things to be done for them at these, at these very sacred temples. Here's another example right, where you'd log in, you request the prayer uh, or the ritual and then it's done in your name for you uh, and then you get the offerings and things left over shipped back to you. At this time, it's, it's hard to say how far this technology would go. I, I envision that, that in a very short period of time, many of the temples will be wired 24-7 with live feed video cameras. But it depends on the type of ritual being done, because some temples restrict things like photographs. So if they're not allowing photographs, they're not allowing the people to come in and record the ritual and, and then upload it to the internet or send the tape back to people. But some temples do allow it, and some rituals do allow it. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, if in the very near future that these temples are, are even more wired than they are now, and they allow for uh, instantaneous interaction or live feed video. So this is a very important uh, ritual practice. It's being facilitated through the internet. Thousands and thousands of people are taking advantage of it. Um, it's becoming very popular. Um, and what's happening is that it's shrinking space. Right? It's allowing someone who's in North America, who's in California here, to actually in many ways be in that temple or be in that place so that they can conduct that ritual. They can contact the priest, um, have this sacrifice or ritual done for them. Um, and in many ways shrinking space so that they can be there. Now another type of ritual practice that's occurring um, is transporting people instead of to a place uh, that's on the ground or a real sacred site, uh, is transporting them into cyberspace where people have actually engineered sacred space and they've created sacred space um, for people to go in and do ritual. And this is an early example of it. This is Alpha World uh, in 1996. Um, there were some researchers started to look at these virtual reality environments to sort of see what was going on. There's a fellow named Ralph Schroeder, and he started looking around this environment, and he actually found a church had been created in Alpha World um, for people to come on a regular basis and worship. And when he studied this entire environment, he actually he saw that this church was probably the most dynamic, strongest community place in the entire Alpha World, and that people came on a regular basis, they, they respected each other, um, they would do these services, and uh, it was a very strong uh, interaction. There was even a virtual wedding uh, that was conducted in 1996 uh, in Alpha World. This is a, some of the pictures of the virtual wedding. You can see that they programmed in things like the flowers, they made it into an open air, um, you know, beautiful place to have a wedding. Um, and they conducted a real ritual. It was a real wedding ritual where people logged in from all over the world. The different users came to the ceremony. Uh, they had a, a person in charge who, who facilitated. And then you had the bride and the groom. Uh, here's the um, 
the ritual that went with it. They say, even when we were worlds apart, just keep this promise in your heart. In sickness and in health, for richer or poorer, I do. For richer or poorer, as long as you live, I do. A little emoticon, right? smiley face. Uh, and I'll pronounce you man and wife. And this was a real ritual. Right? It was facilitated. It happened in a virtual reality environment, but it was a real wedding. And for these people, um, it was the real deal. There's a picture of the, the groom there. And, and to facilitate it, they programmed in things like the smile, right, so that the groom would be smiling, the tuxedos, the flowers. Um, they created, they put all those things within the environment to show that this was a ritual, uh, an important sort of event for them. Here's a picture of a bride and groom. Right, so that was 1996. And at that time, you have to remember, sort of the processing power of computers was limited. Um, internet connections were slower, and yet still a lot of people were using this environment for religious activity. If we go to today, 10 years later, this is Alpha World now. Um, you see there's a lot of tourists in here just sort of checking it out. But with the increase in processing power, the increase in, uh, in internet speed, and also the, the, the decrease in the cost of computers, there's a lot more people online participating now in these virtual reality environments. And there's a lot more people doing religion on the internet. Some of the good examples that we have uh, come from a number of the games like EverQuest and Final Fantasy, these online virtual reality environments where you're getting hundreds of thousands of people participating on a regular basis. And we see that some of the groups that are forming, um, some of the clans or some of the, the groups that form to travel through these online environments are basing their themselves on their religious beliefs. So you have Christian groups that are in there, uh, you have Wiccan, neo-pagan groups, and they will do things like ritual, but for the most part they will use it for sort of trying to convert other people to their belief system. So there will be the Christian groups that will be going around and they will actually help someone, uh, and then they'll talk to them about Christianity at the same time. And there are also rituals being facilitated. I'll just show a more recent um, wedding ceremony. That last one was 1996, this one is 2002. Uh, this is Final Fantasy. And again, a very real wedding. Um, they've adapted it so that they actually have wedding rings, so they could choose the wedding rings. Um, here's this, this ceremony. It was October, uh, Halloween on 2002. So you had the rings, the vows. The person, the priest in charge was actually a, a uh, non-player character. One of the programmers from Final Fantasy volunteered to be the priest to facilitate this ritual. Um, and they had this, this real wedding ceremony for these people in this virtual reality environment. Now the question comes up though, you know, is this a real ceremony? Is this a real ritual? Is this, can you do something like that in cyberspace? Is it even real space? And one of the issues you have to deal with when they're doing ritual is that, well, what is sacred space anyways? Right? Is this real space or is it sacred space? And, and is that possible in something that's just created by programs? Um, so trying to answer that question, the easiest thing to do is to think about, well, what is sacred space? What is sacred space? If we went, this is just a picture of a church. I, I had wished I had uploaded some of the ones I had from the Stanford campus, a beautiful uh, environment for today's lecture, but this one will do. Um, for a lot of people, this is sacred space. And if you went to this church and you asked them, you know, what makes this space sacred? Uh, is it the building? Is it the bricks? They would say, no. You know, it's not the things that built this space that make it sacred. Well, what is it then? Um, it could be the symbols involved. Uh, it could be the rituals that they have. In many cases, it's also the rules and the regulations. So you know, you know, you're not supposed to talk. You know there's a separation. You're not allowed to walk up to the altar. You can't just go into this environment. Um, and sacred space, though, is very subjective. There's no sacred space meter. Like, I don't have a thing where I can say, well, this is a seven on the, on the scale of sacred space. It's actually a very subjective thing um, for, the, for the participant. And we know that because what one person sees as sacred space, like a mountain or a tree or a spring, um, you may bring them here and ask them, well, is this sacred space? And they will say, no, no, this isn't. This is definitely not sacred space. And you could take someone from this environment where this is sacred space to them and take them to a place like Ayers Rock and say, well, you know, do you see the sacred space here? And they would say, no. No, this isn't sacred space. My church was. So it's a very subjective thing. But first and foremost, it's not something that's made or created from the building blocks. Right? So it's not because of these bricks that they built this building that they have sacred space. Now, if we go to somewhere like Second Life, um, the same thing is happening there, and that is not the code that's making these environments that can make it sacred. It's just like the bricks that made the building. It's irrelevant. It's the the people involved that view it as sacred space that actually then gives it its meaning. And they view it that way, um, and it's sacred for them. And we know that because there are a number of churches now that have made it their mission. They're offline churches. They have real churches, uh, in, particularly in North America. But they've made it their mission to also have online churches, where they've spent the money and the time and the programming to actually create an online virtual church or a virtual representation of them. And if you ask them, if you ask the ministers, 
is this a real church? They'll say, yes, it is. Even though it's in a virtual reality environment, it's a real church and we have a real mission here. And this is a real sacred space to us. And they will program in or they will uh, broadcast in their live services. And you can certainly see um, there are a lot of sacred symbols there. For when people come into this environment, a lot of people would say that this is very sacred for them, even though it's a virtual reality environment. And here's a good example. Um, this is my friend John Billadou. Uh, he's uh, finishing up his PhD at Concordia University in Montreal. And he and I are doing a research project looking at Second Life and the religious environment in Second Life. And surprisingly, a num there are a number of uh, cases of people taking the time to create sacred space. Right? And they're, they're doing this on their own, but they're creating a lot of sacred space, a lot of sacred sites within Second Life. Um, this is a good example. This place, there is a gate there, so that sort of separates out this space. The person that created this environment says, you know, what's behind this gate is, is special, it's different. It's, it's set apart from everything else, but that gate opens, it's not locked. You just go up to it and you touch it and it will open and you can go in. And then when you go in, um, you've got a very sacred icon uh, within this environment. So you can go up and you can actually get um, a visual contact with the icon, which is a very sacred way of worshiping, certainly within the Orthodox tradition, but many traditions, just seeing the icon is a connection with the sacred. So it's there. Uh, it's in this place. They put things like candles. A lot of symbols have been brought into the environment so that for people uh, participating, it actually is a very sacred encounter, even though it's in a virtual reality world. Uh, this is the same church. Uh, what they've also done when you go into these environments, I mean, it's a beautiful environment. A lot of work went into creating it. Um, and when you go into these environments, they have little packets for your avatar uh, that you pick up when you go in the temple. So it will give you the ability to do something like pray, uh, to kneel and pray, or to uh, sit and meditate, or things like that. Now, the big question here, though, is this, you know, is this, is this a real sort of religious practice? You know, is it a real religious practice? And I think uh, the best way to think of it is that, like all these other examples I've given earlier, when people talk about it and they say it's sort of the next best thing, uh, and I can, I can explain that um, in, in one way. I like to golf. I like to go golfing. And when I was in Toronto a little while ago, I actually went to a golf simulator. And it's a very complex room you go in, and it has Doppler radar. Uh, and you have a big screen, and you have real golf clubs, and you hit a real golf ball. And there's all different types of grass. And you know, depending upon where your ball lies, you set it on the, on the grass, and you get to play golf. And it's a lot of fun. Now, it's not the same thing. There's no question it's not the same thing. I mean, I like golf because you're walking, you can smell the fresh grass, you can hear the birds, you're in the open air, um, and that's a lot of fun, and, and this was not like that. But it was the next best thing. You know, in Canada, when it's winter time, you don't get to golf, you know, so you don't get to go anyways. Um, and it's, and or if you want to go, it could be expensive. There's all the hassle with tea times. You know, if you want to get your friends together to go golfing on the weekend, you're going to have to meet at 7.04. Um, and sometimes it's not that much fun. And, and the simulator, though, the, the golf simulator was... Um, the next best thing. And you have to remember that people in our contemporary society, a lot of them might not go to church on a regular basis. Right? What if you work on the weekends? You can't go to church on Sunday if you're working. But if you're in Second Life Saturday night, um, you could go to a church. You could pop in. Or a lot of people don't even go to church anyway. So uh, for them, it's, it's, it's certainly the next best thing that they can at least go into this environment. Um, they can see the church. They can see the, uh, the icons. And they can see sermons um, and get this sort of religious information that they may not get elsewhere. So I would say it is, it is the next best thing. And here's another example. This is a Hindu temple in Second Life. And for a lot of people, being the next best thing might be the only thing for them. I mean, most people would be intimidated to walk up to a Hindu temple and knock on the door and say, well, can I come in and can you tell me about your belief system and what are you doing? Um, but in Second Life, if you're traveling around, uh, this is a big, beautiful temple. You can spot it. You can fly down to it. You can go into this environment. Um, and then there are the gods, and there's, there's their, their way of worship. And again, um, you can get a packet so that you can worship also, or you can get information. And for a lot of people, this is really the only contact they're going to have with Hinduism. But it's going to give them information. They're going to see the statues. They're going to find out how people do it. So it's the next best thing. And certainly um, a very interesting and dynamic environment. And we see that with things like Buddhist temples. Um, where those are real icons, um, and you can go in and sit and meditate or look at the, uh, um, look at the icons and get information about the belief system. Uh, this is a Zen temple. Right? So for a lot of people, though, they may never get to a real Zen temple. Right? They may not. They, might, they may never get there, but in Second Life now they can. Now the truth is, though, with Second Life, I mean, there's millions of people signed up, a lot of people participating on it. As far as the numbers actually doing um, this type of religious practice, it's hard to say. It's probably in the thousands. Right? It's, not, it's not a huge number of people at this time, but I think that it is expanding and more and more people are starting to use it for this activity. Um, but 
it's hard to say. Uh, we'll see where that goes. It's one of these things that's just developing even as we speak, and it's a new uh, way that people are socially shaping the technology so that it can meet their religious needs. I mean, um, creating that type of environment uh, is quite fascinating, and it certainly is an example of the social shaping of technology. Um, I'll, I'm running low on time, but I'd like to talk about just two more areas where religion on the internet is actually having a, a, a very significant impact, where a lot of people are participating, and that's involved in crisis ritual. Um, when we talked about the internet being able to shrink space and bring people in virtual pilgrimage close to a site, um, that also seems to be happening in terms of crisis, and, and particularly um, when something happens, something bad happens, uh, often people will do some sort of spontaneous ritual to deal with it or somehow to connect with it. A good example was the tsunami in December of uh, 2004. When that happened, I mean, it was an overwhelming event. It was a horrific event, and a lot of people were very moved, but how do you connect with the site? You know, in this case, how do you do religion if your religious beliefs are to help others or to, to somehow do charity work or to, um, you know, if that's part of your, of your doing religion, um, how do you connect with the site? How do you actually do that when these type of things happen? And it seems that the internet is facilitating that and is actually a very powerful tool for connecting people with places where uh, things like disaster have occurred. So in this case, this was within Hinduism. Uh, a lot of local temples used the internet so they could tell people about what was going on, so they could generate funds, and then they could distribute that money. And for a lot of people, it became a crisis ritual. When that ter horrific event happened, um, and they were moved and they felt to do something, they actually got up and they went to their computer and depending upon their belief system, they may have gone to the Red Cross or they could have gone a number of different organizations, but they went to these sites where they could get this information and pulled out their credit card and gave. Right? And in many ways, that's a crisis ritual. They're trying to facilitate uh, a religious activity, but they're using the internet to do it. And it, it brought them close. It brings you to the site. It connects you with that environment. Um, so in many ways, you can be there and you can see what's happening um, and, in, and also impact on that environment. You're really doing something. Even though you're an avatar and you're 3,000 miles away, you're really connecting with the place and you're really um, helping. You're really doing something. Another type of crisis ritual, um, we'll skip through this, uh, but with something like 9-11 and, uh, and crisis in memorials, this is probably one of the most powerful spiritual environments on the internet right now, I would say, are the online memorials. I mean, when you encounter them, if you're looking at different types of religious activity that's going on, on the internet, and you can look at the religious rituals, and they're very interesting, and some of these beautiful sacred spaces are, are overwhelming almost in the complexity that's created them. But if you want to talk about sort of a sacred feeling or an in-your-gut sacred sense, um, when you go to the online memorial sites, that's where it really hits you. And this was after 9-11, very quickly after 9-11, um, as a crisis ritual. Uh, a lot of people had to do something. You know, they had to do something somehow to deal with this, uh, this event. And, and most people, when they're trying to deal with crisis like that, turn to religion. Uh, in this case, they went online and they lit candles. Right? They actually lit a candle. And it's a very, in many ways, it's a very religious sort of activity. Um, but it was facilitated through the internet. And a lot of people came together. Um, they rallied. They, they did these sort of online quick crisis rituals to be able to deal with this issue. So in a very short period of time, there was about 600,000 candles had been lit um, as a crisis ritual. And the other thing, uh, we'll just skip through that, the other thing is the online memorial sites. Right? Very powerful places. I mean, traditionally when someone passes away, uh, you get a memorial, an obituary in a newspaper, and there's a, you know, 40 in them a day. It's a little tiny, a few lines, and that doesn't do justice to anybody's life. Right? We all know that. It's not really a, a satisfying way of communicating about someone. And well, what's developing on the internet is that people are allowing for online memorials. So you can create a site where you can upload audio and video, you can have a message. People can actually come in and leave messages, they can light virtual candles, they can leave virtual flowers so that this person's memory um, is maintained on the internet. And these are very powerful uh, places and certainly a very uh, sacred site um, when it comes to religion on the internet, a very sacred place when it comes to religion on the internet. And these are becoming much more popular. This is, again, uh, I would say one direction that religion on the internet is going. So I burned through that talk pretty fast. Um, we'll end at where we left off. Uh, this is just sort of one aspect of some of the thing, you know, an introduction to some of the things that are going on, on online as far as religion and the internet goes. Um, so I hope I didn't overwhelm you with too much material. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. So thank you for listening. Thanks. Yeah. So you've described you know, a lot of people who seem to be on the internet for surprisingly intimate religious rituals. Um, 
the thing that stood out to me in particular was sort of the religious bottom of our crisis, right? So, at least in you know, Western society, we have this notion that there's a certain privilege that appears in your communication with like you know, a priest, right? It's so right. a notion of like the priest and anything. Mm -hmm. So, what's the status of the law as it relates to sort of that sort of activity? Right, I mean, and that's it. Sort of, so, you know, there's a question of sort of in the real world, what makes you a priest? It turns out that there's not much, but you know, like a, it's a lot of resistance. Sure. Like, has any of this appeared like in the courtroom, you know, uh, based on communications over the internet? I mean, that's a very interesting topic, and it has to do with religious authority. You know, who's really a priest online, or who has authority online, and particularly for doing facilitating rituals um, and things like that. We see in places like Alpha World, people would literally take turns. Um, and so there was no real leader. They're very uh, non-hierarchical, where different people could have different levels of authority. In Usenet groups and, and different um, sort of organized or online religious sites, it often has to do with the people that have been there the longest, right? They've established the most cop, uh, cultural capital in the group. They're the most respected, and they sort of become the default leaders. Um, but they have no real authority and no real power other than what the group respects in them and what the group sees in them. Um, as far as the authenticity or the, the legality of something like an online wedding, um, it, you know, it's a ceremony for the community so that the, that online community can participate in it. The, uh, you know, when that person up there says, I now pronounce you man and wife, if everyone respects it, then it's a performative utterance within ritual so that you know, the social reality has transformed. But as far as the legality of it goes outside of Second Life, um, then they have to follow through with that and get a real legal uh, certificate and things like that. So, The question is, is that, like, are you aware of any case law that has actually happened? So, for instance, you can imagine a service, right? Like the Catholic web, the Catholic Church has a website called Catholic Network. Right. Where they give out web mail addresses, right? And so, you can imagine them saying, well, we're actually putting up priests, you know, they like, email them their confession, and they right. go back to the right? Or, you know, maybe they, you know, Skype you their confession, and they right. you know, come back, right? I mean, it's, that's, it's, I haven't. I'm not aware of any case law, but certainly you see that in a lot of official organized religions, they are extremely cautious about how authority works online. And that's why there, in many cases, there aren't bulletin boards. Or if there is a bulletin board, it's going to be censored. Um, in many cases, they would, if, uh, they would have a prayer request, would you would have direct contact with them, almost like an email. So you, don't, you, know, you know it's going to them, and you know it's a, sort of an authentic site. But it's, it's a really gray area. Um, and that, that is challenging religious authority, because you know, someone puts up a site, I've looked at a lot of online religious sites, and sometimes people will create these magnificent sites. And often people would think, well, because it's a good looking site and it's very user friendly and it's beautiful, it must be authentic, it must be real, it must, this guy must be a real religious expert. We really know, um, you know, they're not. They're a 12 year old kid uh, who's decided, you know, for whatever reason they want to have a religious website. But that doesn't necessarily give them authority, so. so I should have thought we had a chance of having people to church, then we would have an in runner on like a, our search logs. Sure, sure, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah? Uh, are there any instances of uh, offline authorities actually passing the judgment whether online individual ritual is valid? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and certainly the more the, the traditional uh, religious communities do not see, I mean, the issue is cyberspace. Is cyberspace real space? And if it's a real space, then can you have authentic religion there? Um, and most of the orth, uh, sort of official organized religions would say no. They'd say, you know, we can use the internet for giving information and it's, it's good for communicating, but that's not real space. Right? And if you want to do religion, you come to church. Um, and that, that thing that's on that internet, you know, that's not, that's not church. It's not the same. So you do see uh, tension there. But what happens then if the official church doesn't allow for it, you know, that Catholic website is a very good example where they're not allowing for chat, they're not allowing for prayer requests, they're not allowing for interaction, they're not allowing for online religion, then people will just keep looking until they find a place where they can do it. So if they're Catholic and they can't get that type of interactivity at the Vatican, then they're going to start looking around. They're probably going to end up at a non-official site um, that might not even be recognized or sanctioned by the Vatican um, where there will be sort of this Catholic environment where then they could participate or talk about, uh, you know, share prayers, things like that. So. Uh, situations where you have particular obligations like pilgrimages and things like that, mm -hmm. the Hajj. I mean, I understand that uh, Islam can be somewhat forgiving if, uh, if you know, circumstances don't. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's recommended you go on Hajj, that's right. But if you can't afford it or if you're not able, then that's fine. Has there been any official recognition that online uh, is, uh, someone is 
you know, at least has some value. I think so. And even, I mean, the Pope, the last Pope, uh, the last Pope did do virtual pilgrimage. And he had allowed, when he was actually on a pilgrimage, for it to be broadcast live and so that people could sign in virtually and virtually watch this thing go on. So in that sense, they recognized that maybe as a tool for shrinking space, uh, it was effective or it was valid. Um, I don't know if you got penance for, or you got like a... Uh, less purgatory, you know, officially recognized less purgatory, like doing the Reek at Code Pratt, uh, Craig Patrick, where you climb to the top of the mountain, you know, that's official. Uh, you may even get a document saying that, you know, this has happened. Um, I, I'm not aware of that type of uh, level yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you, again, this is very new. Uh, and as people, if people really desire for that, um, then the technology, I think with social shaping of technology, sort of the spiritualizing of the internet where, uh, you know, they're adapting the technology so that it can meet their religious and spiritual needs. And if they really want that, I would say that that's going to come, you know, that they will at least make it or make that available for people. Yeah. Yes. You covered some sort of unorthodox or more difficult religious things we want to you know, Right. Trying to be there is you know, hard. But you can, right. So what about the things that are in that religion that are national part of that? Right. I mean, it's it's a very, yeah, it's a very powerful tool for that. And and, and teaching scripture, uh, meeting online to do uh, to you know f uh, for things like Bible study, um, prayer meetings, prayer gatherings also are very common. Um, as far as biblical studies go, it's actually been an enormous resource because you can go and get a number of different copies of the Bible are available online for free, and you can compare pieces of different testaments and different scriptures and see different versions. And um, a, a website that is an official site of uh, the LDS, the Church of Latter-day Saints, actually has a huge section uh, on Bible study and, and uh, you know, a lot of material online so that they're making it available to people uh, for that reason so that you can use it. Another good example, though, is in uh, some countries, in some Muslim countries, you're not allowed to bring certain scriptures. So if you are uh, in diaspora, you're Hindu, and you're working in, uh, say, the Middle East, you can't bring a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in with you in through the airport security, and you cannot read it in that country. You're not allowed to worship that way in that country because it's a Muslim country, and the, the rules and regulations and the laws are structured that way. So it's not allowed. But um, what happened, again, to social shaping of technology to facilitate people that are in diaspora is that there are websites where you can log in and you can say, you know, I'm working here, but I, I don't have a copy of the Gita. Can you, you know, and they'll send you different scriptures and you can talk online and you can meet with uh, priests online and do all that sort of thing, um, even though in the offline world you're not allowed. So, you know, providing that type of sacred scripture, even though in that case you're not supposed to have it. But I think for a lot of people, um, you know, as information-seeking behavior, it's really affecting them. You know, if you have a question about something, a religious question, uh, you can turn to the internet now and you can try and get answers. You can look at different sacred texts. You can look at things that you may not have had access to before. You know, um, and that, that is affecting people. I think it is affecting people. Yeah. Is that good? All right, well, thank you very much uh, for your patience. I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Thanks, Rich.